Welcome to the My Haunt Life Podcast. Hello, welcome to the My Haunt Life Podcast. I'm Mike. And I'm Russell. And this is part two of our latest episode because we had so much stuff to talk about and so much stuff has happened with the Lust Experience. Okay, uh, Mike? What? So, I know you don't like the intro. But everyone else does. Okay. Or mostly but, everyone. But I I couldn't resist like trying alternate versions. Well, I think that maybe, you know, there might be a version of the intro that could be a little bit different as things develop, right? Okay. All right. So, um, say it for me one more time. <sighs> the lust experience. <laughs> Call me Russell, call me Russell, call me Russell, call me Russell. Oh, yeah. I'm sorry, I couldn't resist making that. <laughs> well, here's, here's your first mistake. You playing that makes everyone realize that it's out there. Oh, it's and out there. You put it out there. Now they are going to want that one. No, 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 no. no. That, was, that was a joke. No, seriously. That was, that was just a, I just wanted to mess with you. <laughs> I just wanted to mess with you. But no, Now seriously. I know how Darren feels when Clint is on Facebook and he's like, why aren't you writing? You're making things as jokes like this when. Okay. You know. But no, here, here was my thought. Seriously. Here was my thought it was like, because so much has happened. And Noah Sinclair is sort of like the, the forefront character right now, right? For now. So For now. And so, you know, and he's all about the power thing and the system and all of that. So, you know, I thought this is what we need. You know what we need? We need a catchphrase. Oh, no. So this is what I would like to pitch, at least for now, as our intro. So give it to me again. <laughs> Don't you're going to tell me that during a lust conversation? <laughs> Come on, man. Maybe you should be saying that to Noah after he said, call me Russell. Yes. The lust experience. Lust. Show me your power. Oh, yeah. Oh, my God, dude. <laughs> I'm so happy right now. <laughs> oh, that. Oh. I, maybe we just should not have sound effects for this. Oh, come on. It's a catchphrase. Did you? Lust. Show me your power. Oh, yeah. Oh, my God, dude. <laughs> this is like, ugh. did you get that from like a porno or something? Where did you get that? I have lady friends. No, <laughs> Seriously. Where did you get that? Seriously, I, I brought someone in to record that. Oh, my God. <laughs> I, I, I went to a friend of mine and said, would you come over to my office and bring your sexy with you? <sighs> and she did not report me to human resources. <laughs> oh, that, oh. <laughs> so, no. God damn it, Russell. It's a catchphrase. I thought that's, like, maybe not, do... that's not a catchphrase. Tell that's, me your power. That, don't, tell, don't ever say that to me again. <laughs> Especially... Don't make eye contact when you say it. <laughs> Jesus Christ, man. That. <sighs> okay. Back to the drawing board. I'll try something but else. But here's the thing. Okay. Uh -huh. <sighs> Noah doesn't need to show us anything because he's trying to teach us. No, the it's a like for the lust experience in general. Mm. No? no. Okay. We leave it up to the community. <sighs> OG or this one? <laughs> because I'm I'm never voting ever again. Okay. Well, at least I had fun. <laughs> bet you did. You talked to a girl finally. Oh, thanks. <laughs> <laughs> All right. So, Mike, stuff has happened. Oh, my God. So much stuff has happened. Yeah. It, it, it happened at a fast pace, too. Which, by the way, um, people started messaging us about the my shadow life or something, and <laughs> we'd like to apologize because we're not sure how that happened. It just kind of randomly showed up. So we're sorry if you thought that was us. It Don't wasn't. get confused. Don't get confused. Uh, we think it was OSDM rearranging old podcasts in a way to make us sound like other things. So we're not really sure. Um, but thank you guys for, for the support and sticking with us, even though that thing got out there. 
It was a glitch. So Lust is turning nuts. Yeah. Um, On many different levels. (laughs) Since we last recorded, Julie ran into Darren at Cavell. Right. uh, Part of the ABC project. Shout out to Annie Lesser. And I guess after the show, they were chatting and it turned into something which her description of this was very odd yeah because you expect just running into someone at a show wouldn't turn into info being dumped on you or hinted at or so yeah this this sounded very odd in-game info yeah when they spoke darren told her that he and clint got kicked off of lust and that it was probably the investors that kicked them off and the investors are sending calls and he wasn't behind it and had nothing to do with it. So it's official. Darren and Clint are not part of lust. So all of these interactions, all of these phone calls are not from them. Supposedly. Are you calling Darren a liar? No, I'm just saying that this, the, I, I like several other people thought this was very suspicious sounding. Yeah, it's, it's odd, but after all that happened, you know, there was a big discussion about it. People started reaching out to Darren and Clint, making sure they were okay. And the Clint Sears on the forums posted, I feel the need to address a rumor that was being discussed last night. And last night is in regards to uh, what Julie and Darren talked about at Cavell. I'm sure that many of you have reached out to contact me. I appreciate everything's concern. I think it should be everyone's. Shadow Clint. Da, da, da. I don't believe that Darren and I meant to release the information that we did last night, but secrets can be told after inebriation. While Darren sleeps off the joy he had last night, ja, 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 which is ha, ha, ha in Spanish, which is another theory. eh, We'll get into that. I thought I would now try to clear the air as best I can. Darren and I have agreed to leave the project for a myriad of valid reasons that will have absolutely no effect on the quality of the show, and we remain as committed as ever to the Lust experience now that we get to enjoy it as fans ourselves. It is very exciting and refreshing to be in a position where we do not know where the story will go, and we look forward to finding out along the way with the rest of you. I personally will be very busy in the upcoming months, and I hope you will forgive me if I do not return any correspondence within a timely manner. Thank you, CCS and DB. So they're off of lust, apparently. But here's the thing. Darren usually signs off as DLB and Clint as CS. True. But this time they switched. So that goes back to the whole reflection and shadow thing where Clint is putting his middle initial in and Darren isn't. Are they reflections of each other? Yeah. Perhaps. Who knows? Or are they shadow people? (laughs) Then there was more fun. On the Lust Facebook a bunch of dates started appearing and one date would happen and then it would get edited to show another date. Then it would get edited to show another date. Then it got edited and edited and finally deleted. The dates were 4 2 16, 4 2 17, 5 2 17, 5 13 17, 5 13 13, finally ending with only 10. And Everyone started theorizing about what that meant because was it a mistake? Was it going back in time? And all of these fun things. Yeah, eventually it became clear that one of those actually was a very important valid date. And information. So while people were theorizing about what those mysterious numbers appearing in Facebook meant, uh, Brian actually wound up getting an email from Clint with an image of pancakes and a reference about having breakfast with him at South by Southwest. Except Brian admitted that he and Clint had never had breakfast while they were at South by Southwest at the same time for the lust, uh, pardon me, for the tension experience panel, which Brian moderated. So looking closely at the image, hidden inside the image information was the message, trust me, walk the fuck away, Brian, now. So everyone began theorizing that this might be a message from Clint to tell Brian to get out of the lust experience, or was Brian, in his job as a journalist, investigating something, looking at a story that Clint felt he needed to walk away from? Right. How real is this game going to get? So Brian got a second email from Clint to make sure everyone got the info from the first email. So, and what everyone did is people started looking at the photo that Brian had shared eventually and listed in sort of the metadata area, 
depending on how you look at the photograph, that message did appear. But why was Clint giving Brian this information, specifically Brian? And that's what no one seems to be able to figure out, including Brian himself, probably. Yeah, Brian <laughs> is just, man, he is getting messed with so hard. Yes, he is. But it's fun to watch. <laughs> Brian's a nice guy. Yeah, so that's why it's gonna fun. mess with him. <laughs> so after numerous theories about the dates, and after numerous theories about what that message might have meant, a couple of days later, there was a Facebook post with a zip code, and it was 90013, Thursday, only one. So that would certainly seem to indicate that on Thursday, somebody was going to have a one-on-one -on -one meeting with somebody. Right. And immediately it became the question of how is this person going to be chosen? What is this person going to get to do or mm -hmm. be asked to do? Because obviously so far the one-on-ones have been a little precarious. Oh, yeah. With people being threatened with blackmail and people being uh, compromised or flirted with in bars. Mm -hmm. Compromised. That's an, unfair, <laughs> that's an unfair statement. I'm sorry. <laughs> Messed with in bars. So what ended up happening was Kristen on the forums gets a call and she says that if she comes to an event, if she could bring one person, who would that person be? She decides to pick Julie. So Julie then got a call. The instruction for Julie was that she needed to go to a wonderful, wonderful place, Mike. <laughs> heaven? Uh, yeah. For some of us, it's a version of heaven. The last bookstore in downtown Los Angeles, which for uh, book geeky people is seriously a wonderful, wonderful, old-fashioned, quirky bookstore. Huge, massive, lots of cool little nooks and crannies and rooms. And there are, you've been to their sci-fi horror section, right? Of course. It's like in this weird bank vault and it's creepy and I, I love that place. But I digress. <laughs> So she goes to the bookstore and she ends up meeting with Sarah, Sarah Sinclair. She got an invitation to something on April 2nd, which is one of the dates which had appeared on that weird series of numbers on Facebook. She was given the chance to pick five people. And really quickly. I think she Very only quickly. had like 90 seconds, like write down the names of five people that you want to attend with you. So she was put on the spot and she immediately chose five names. So then they basically put her on the spot again. Yeah, they flipped it on her. And they said, if those people are coming, you can't come. Right. So but it's if... either them or you. Yes, exactly. And she decided that she would go. And it's very funny because she periscoped about this, Mike. And I don't know, some people... Some people thought that that was an unfair decision on her part. I am completely in Julie's camp on this. And Julie explained it on Periscope because Julie had met Noah in the Ascension. Mm -hmm. And she simply said on the Periscope, we have unfinished business. Right. So Julie absolutely should have chosen herself. And I think Julie... Well, actually... I wouldn't say she should have. It. The, the, here's the thing. She, she could have chosen herself or she could have chosen her friends. There's right. no wrong answer. So yes. it's not like... Oh, she did a bad thing. She didn't do a bad thing at all. She just made a choice. Well, I think she she saw, she seemed to express a little bit of guilty feelings in the Periscope. Oh, well, of course. Anybody in that situation, no matter what they picked, would be left with some sort of bad feelings. If, if either... I disagree with you. Really? Yeah. So you're either going to miss out on something cool or you're going to not have your friends go. What do you think, uh, what do you think I would have made in that, in that situation? Have because your friends go. Yeah, I probably would have. Yeah. But 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 you still would have had this like not horrible feeling, but a feeling of like crap, what am I not going to get? What yeah, am I not going to see? Not what am I not going to um, get miss out? So that's my point. Either way, there's going to be a negative thing. Perhaps. But no, I I just when she expressed expressed what decision she had made, it totally made sense to me. Oh yeah. I just yeah. Yeah, it made sense. Like it and there's there's nothing wrong with that. Right. Like if 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 people are think, giving I I just got the sense that she might have felt a little bit worse than she should have. Oh, got it. So, you know, the way she expressed it on the periscope and and I just thought like, no, absolutely she did she she made that decision and it was not throwing anybody under a bus. It wasn't Yeah, cuz she know, didn't know at the time. Cuz she didn't know. So, um yeah, so I I just um yeah, I I thought it was a good call for her to make. Um so she was in 
for yep. the focus group that was coming up on that Sunday. And then later that night, Buzz put together a get together at a bar for all the losers, quote unquote. That's what uh, he called them. <laughs> well, it's all the people that got an email response from Noah saying that they're losers. So he had a losers meet up, just, you know, fun get together, community type thing. And while he's there, he gets a call and was told to pick four people. And he picked four people that were there with him. And it also included himself. So five total people himself. And then he had to pick four people and they would be going to Sunday's focus group. So that's six people. The next day, something interesting happens. Noah emails us. Yeah. Obviously at this point, everyone was wondering how are those last slots going to be filled? Right. Because this goes back to the only 10 that was posted on Facebook. So there were six spots. There were four left. Mm hmm. And Noah emails us, and the email says, Games, games, games. Sometimes you can't win for trying, boys. I was a little uh, over-served last night, and things got weird. You want to know the biggest secret of all? These spots? It's not as much who gets picked, but how. Do I go overboard sometimes, watching people dance and whip each other under the bus? abso freaking lutely and some free advice on the house. It's how you tell what you are working with and how you get it done. People show their true colors while you make them feel special, like they've earned love. I should mention that the words special and loved were capitalized. Mm -hmm. They give a little more each time that way. Also, if you had an, uh, any idea of what my real, well, never mind. The point is people seem to like you too. Usually that's a concept I have little time for, but let's reel it back in and use some honey rather than whatever the fuck else is the opposite of honey in that stupid hick metaphor. Sorry, my head is throbbing harder than a priest's cock at Chuck E. Cheese. <laughs> what I'm saying is I need to fill four more spots for our little focus group on Sunday and you guys have them. All four spots are yours. Do as thou will. Now, I'm sure we will have some boring trust issues. So I'll lay down the parameters so you don't ask the genie for more wishes. I need one of you to go. You can both go if you want, whatever, but one from my haunt life's gruesome twosome. Always be marketing. And then three more. If you don't pick any or try to give up both of your spots, then it sabotages the whole shebang. That's what she said. Virtual high five to Mike. Kapow. <laughs> yeah. Noah's my boy. <laughs> so, yeah, and I'm sure the trust issues comment was aimed at me. <laughs> Why would you say that? Because I'm always about trust and safety. And <laughs> I know. It's a joke. So, <laughs> so yeah, uh, Noah gave us the four spots. And, and also, we, uh, we, we shared parts of the email when this came about um, just because we weren't sure what was going to happen. So that's why it's happened. It's been a while since that came. Uh, that's what she said. Uh, uh, high, virtual high five, Noah. And so that's why we feel uh, a little bit better to release the whole thing because there's some stuff he says in there that we didn't really want to share if there were spots that were still up for grabs um, because he's basically saying the way people get picked, it, it's a game to him. Well, also, I, I think I think in the community, he sends some... There was some animosity growing because, you know, Buzz called this this meetup the losers party. And so the people who got accepted emails were like, wait, are we being excluded? Why are we being excluded? So I think he detected that there was some animosity, just some growing in the community. Mm -hmm. It's like, come on, Mike, he used us. Right. And it's like, and we talked about it at the time. We both realized that Noah was using us. But as it says, always think about marketing. So that's why he makes a comment about people liking my haunt life. Like, so he went to the people who some people respect and like and said, okay, you choose. Mm -hmm. That takes the heat off him. Totally. He's, yep. he's a very clever, smart guy. Yeah. That's, that's I'm, I'm, oh, I can't believe I'm about to say this. I'm gaining more respect for Noah Sinclair as we go along. Yeah. You don't have to like him, but it's, you can respect him. Yeah, exactly. Exactly. Cause you know, I, you know, I've said early on, you know, he, his whole system doesn't appeal to me. But when I read that email, I was like, this you, guy you knows bastard. what he's doing. <laughs> no, I, I like totally like this guy knows what he's doing. Like, he's a smart guy. Mm -hmm. Like, this is a, I never saw it coming in a million years. I was stunned when I read that email. Oh, yeah. So, but it's a smart play on his part. Yep. 
because he doesn't have to take any flack. Yeah, exactly. And he put we, it on us. And we, and we did. <laughs> and we took flack. <laughs> yeah. I mean, and that's the thing. You're never going to make everybody happy when there's only two spots. Right. Exactly. And now here, now what now about, about you and I going, because he said only one of us had to go. What did I say to you about me? Uh, that you might not want to go. Right. So, and, I, and, you know, we talked about it and, but, you know, you brought up a point to me, which is very valid and I think was a stronger point. I think it would have been slightly cowardice on my part if I didn't go because I was just like, the system doesn't appeal to me. You know, I don't, you know, but I got to admit this email was intriguing. The fact that he was choosing to play it the way he was, but here's the thing. It's not that I've really talked crap about Noah. I don't think I've done that. I've just flat out stated like the system doesn't appeal to me right as a person. He doesn't impress me the, the amount of bravado he's putting out. So if I've said that publicly, accepting this invitation was a way for me to sort of put my money where my mouth was. Mm -hmm. And, you know, I didn't know if, uh, we would actually meet Noah Sinclair if this was a focus group. Well, no. and also I, what I told you that, okay, we're going to throw it back on him because he made the comment about when you give people like make them feel special and loved, they're going to work that much harder. <laughs> so in, in our reply, it's, you know what? We're, we chose to both go because that way we can always be marketing. And when we talk about you and your system and the focus group, it's that much better for you and for everything yep. that you're doing. So we tried to throw it back at him and basically say we're learning. Exactly. So we chose Hazel and LaSalle. Mm -hmm. And we made that decision. We talked about several people, and but everyone we talked about shared something in common. And that was fairly new to the game and people who hadn't seemed to be getting a lot of attention perhaps, but, but we're or, still super active, active on the forums. That was key. That was the main factor in, in the names that we considered. Uh, and, um, yeah, some people let us know that they weren't happy, that they wanted other more prominent people, people who had been through tension and gotten attention in tension that people let us know that they were unhappy with those decisions at times. Yeah. But I stand by our decisions, man. Yeah. And then here's the fun thing that happened is LaSalle was apparently out of town and yes. was not checking emails. <laughs> um, so she couldn't go. And when we found that out, we had emailed Noah and like, what do you want us to do? We have other names uh, that if you want them. And he told us to let the community decide. Mm -hmm. And so we set up that thread and based on everybody's votes, I guess you can say, yeah. uh, everyone, uh, a lot of people voted for Candace. So she went in LaSalle's place. Absolutely. So with Candace being chosen, that was the 10, that was the 10 people for the focus group on Sunday. Then the focus group happens on Sunday mm -hmm. and I'm bummed out because as soon as I found out the zip code and realized it was in K town, immediately my first thought is Korean barbecue. <laughs> we're, we're eating Korean barbecue before we go. And I don't know if many people realize how much Mike thinks with his stomach. <laughs> hey, it's good and all you can eat. And yes. it's amazing. It's very tasty. Um, but there was also another uh, pre meetup that I, we found out about afterwards. So we weren't able to make that one, unfortunately, but that's where everyone else was. Mm -hmm. um, so we're all waiting and we had a time. It was going to be four o'clock. Four o'clock comes, no information. <laughs> four o' five comes, no information. Four ten, four fifteen. I think it wasn't until after like four, like around four twenty or something. I don't remember, but um, yeah, it was it was a while. <laughs> yeah, we finally got an address, and so you and I were waiting by the car. I was refreshing my phone to the point of my battery dying, and then finally it happened. It was like, okay, go. Here's the address. Get in. Because we didn't, you know, you never know. Is it first come, first <laughs> serve? Is it, are they going to wait for us? Um, who knows? But we, luckily we were pretty close and we got there around the same time as uh, Buzz and Kristen. Mm -hmm. And we go to this building, which is a very familiar building to us. <laughs> yes. Uh, we've seen shows from Heretic there. Um, we saw Helder, uh, a magician perform there. Borrow time, LA. Yeah. I guess um, Screenshot, their last show was right around there right. as well. Uh, but we show up and there's a security guard. There's a man in a suit and he's just staring at us, not talking, just 
mean dogging us uh, and telling us to turn our phones off. And then he gets a phone call and he lets the four of us in. And we weren't sure if we were going to have all, if we had to wait for all 10 of us, but we were there. So they let us in. We go through the first room and then go to a second room that's kind of outside. And there's another guy in a suit there, another security guard. And then he lets us into a third room. And in that third room, there's 10 chairs in a circle. Uh, they're all facing outward. So if we're all sitting there, our backs to, are towards one another. There's various video cameras around the room. And then there's a, a snack table with some water and some Tic Tacs, orange Tic Tacs, and I don't know, granola bars or something. And we're waiting for everybody else to get there. Now, one of the things that happens at a lot of conventions I go to, uh, like for work, is sometimes they'll put things on the bottom of your seat, like yes. gift cards or you know things for raffles, stuff like that. Mm -hmm. So as soon as we get in there, I just start going into escape room mode. I start looking under each chair to see if there's anything hidden under there. It's like, oh, you know, the golden ticket to the system or, or something like that. I start doing that. I start looking around the room, just, just looking for anything. Because if it's anything, if tension has taught me anything, it's paranoia. <laughs> so that, that, <laughs> that we might be missing something. Right. So I just, we always are. Yeah. So I just started looking for, for, for things. Couldn't find anything. And I think what I did comes into play later. Well, actually, do you remember that I left the room again? Yeah. You inspired that. <laughs> Was it that I smell? <laughs> <laughs> no, because I saw you go to, and I realized that because we were, I was talking to Buzz sort of on the way in, and we just walked through that first room. And when I saw you go into escape room mic mode, I thought, wait a minute, we walked through an entire room and into a courtyard, and we didn't look at anything. Right. So I went up to the guy because, because like you said, we know that building. I was like, you know what? I went out to the to the to the guy. I'm like, can I go to use the restroom real quick? And he almost it, uh, this. Uh, it's hard to describe this building if you've never been in it. It's sort of the the rooms. The doors can form a circle, mm -hmm. and he almost directed me back inside because behind that one door, there's a restroom. There's another restroom, but I knew that there was one on the way in. So what I did is when I went to the restroom, I went into that other room really quickly Oh. and just looked around. And I think the paint job on the wall is new. I don't know what that means, but that's, I, they wouldn't have painted the whole wall for this event. But there was nothing in it. There was really nothing in it. But, but you inspired me going like, wait a minute, we just literally walked by two characters and were not present. Right. So I did that. And so just really quickly did that. And oh. Or were we so present that we wanted to just follow them <laughs> and follow the rules? Follow the rules. <laughs> so, uh, so that's what I did really quickly. And at that point, I was like, okay. And you know, the security guard was in eye line of me. I stepped into the restroom. And at, when I'm in the restroom, I hear the other people arrive into the room. So I step out and join them. And you mentioned the thing of having to turn off and prove that your cell phone is off. So all the other people go into the room and I hold my phone out to the guy and said, do you want to recheck this? And he said, yes, actually I should. And I gave it to him and he looked at my phone and he smirked. <laughs> and he went, wow, that is one beat up cell phone. <laughs> I was like, yeah, I know. <laughs> Because I I have a crack in the outer cover, oh okay. so and my my uh, my drop guard is completely falling apart, and so he was trying to like like find the speaker and the button and all that, and it's like and he was like wow that is one beat up cell phone, <laughs> so he was mocking my technology. <laughs> so we entered the room, and we'd been given the instruction of find the chair with your name on it, and there were name tags and follow the instructions, and the instructions were basically put on your name tag and don't look through the paperwork. Yeah. Which we all followed. Yep. We did. <laughs> I think. <laughs> yeah. And I found out that I have a suit coat that name tags don't stick to. <laughs> then security tells us to all sit down. And so we're sitting there for a bit. Finally, someone emerges mm -hmm. and it turns out that it is Sarah Sinclair. And she comes in just with this presence, like this, just like, take no crap, like I'm here to do a job, like don't get in my way type of attitude. And 
she starts circling us and looks at each of us in like right in the eye. And I think she circled us about twice. I believe you. And while she's doing this, I'm just staring, like staring her, not staring her down, but just staring at her, making eye contact whenever I could. When she'd go in back of me, I would turn and look at her. I didn't want her out of my sight. And that's part of the paranoia I just (laughs) talked about. And she goes up towards the the snack table and stands there. uh, And she says that she's been observing us for the last 10 minutes. And she looks at me like directly at me while she's standing there and says, you, and I thought she was looking at me, but I wasn't sure. And she's like, yes, you. And I'm just like kind of sitting there, like we're just waiting for something else. So finally I just nod my head and she asked me to come stand next to her. And so I go up and I stand next to her and she, she tells us that she, because based on that observation, I'm free to leave. Mm -hmm. And I, I didn't believe that at first because, you know, I was still like dealing with my clipboard and stuff. And I looked up and I was like, what, what? Yeah. (laughs) And I admit when I was being walked out, I was ready to just be like this and walk out and like flip everyone off, like with my back to them. But I was like, nope, that's not going to be good. But I was, I was mad. I was like, what the hell, man? Like I can have so many good answers for this focus group. And the fact that you, you know, gave up your Sunday and you drove all the way up to LA and, you know, <laughs> it was like, uh, and I will say this, this was discussed, uh, later. My immediate reaction was, uh, it ruffled my feathers. Right. Cause I know what you gave up and that you rearranged your schedule. Like I, I knew that you had made room for this in your, in your weekend. Mm-hmm. It, it pissed me off when they did that to you. Right. Later, it was discussed, uh, we gathered at a bar after this whole event ended. I wasn't the only one in the room who felt that way about you. Right. There were numerous people who were like, how dare they? Thank you, guys. Yeah. It worked out, though. <laughs> <laughs> so, yeah. But it, that, that, we'll, And we'll by get... the way, uh, I don't... Did, my understanding from some of the stuff in the forums is that you didn't hear what Sarah said as you were leaving. I didn't. She... Because uh, you, you agreed. You, you left. Right. You were being escorted out. But as you were being escorted out, I think she expected you to put up a fight because she looked, she kind of looked down at us and she went, oh, uh, well, obviously rejection is really easy for that guy to accept. Whatever. So like, she made a comment similar to that. See, and... but here's the thing. If I, I was invited to their focus group, right. she's in control. Yeah. She's asking the questions. I'm not going to be a douche and be like, no, I'm not leaving. You know, like, yeah, I, I, just, I, I was a little surprised at her comment as well. So but... Sarah, no rejection does not sit well with me, but <laughs> I have more respect for the environment instead of respect for rejection. Yeah. It was, you asked him to leave. <laughs> yeah. So, um, so yeah, as a, when you left, she sort of uh, started a basic standard focus group with us except it did take some twists and turns along the way. She continued circling us. She explained that it was a focus group. She explained that because our opinions did matter, she explained that there was only one mistake that could be made and one misstep that we could perform. And then she waited and she said, would anyone like to take a stab at what that might be? And of course I raised my hand. (laughs) Actually, I raised my pencil. And, um, I said, well, if this is a focus group, the obvious misstep would be dishonesty. And she sort of nodded and she indicated uh, at the very beginning of the group, she had said, can you hear me? Can you hear me? And a couple of us said, oh yes, we can hear you. What we didn't realize is she was actually talking to the people behind the cameras. Oh, okay. And at that point, when I asked, I said, the misstep would be dishonesty. She said, that's the correct answer. And what she did is she leaned up and she pushed on the earpiece she was wearing. She turned toward the camera and said, Russell is the one who gave that correct answer. Getting points already. And at various times during the focus group, she would touch her ear as if she was receiving or being commented to from whoever was observing us. And as you pointed out, there were multiple cameras in the room. So this focus group, as I said, we had clipboards, right? And there was paperwork on the clipboards, and we had been told not to look at them. 
she explains that she's going to read a series of questions and we were to mark the correct answer that applied mostly to us. She said, go with your gut or whatever, um, you know, follow your instinct. That was the basic instruction. So we flip and what it is is she's reading the questions, but there are multiple answers for each question on the paperwork. And all of these are moral and ethical dilemma questions. And they are like, how would you tell a friend that you have committed a heinous crime? You know, you give a gift to someone and you know that they need it, but they don't want it from you. They say, how would you open up the subject for a discussion? How would you treat a boss in a certain situation? Uh, how would you break bad news to your partner? How would you tell someone you're breaking up with them? They were all moral and ethical dilemma questions. So we went through that and I started to notice that sort of to me, the theme was like, how do you handle negative news or negative information? Like, how do you share it? How do you, you know, how would you present it? How do you spin it to some degree? Was sort of the theme to me. Other things were done. We were asked to role play and convince each other uh, uh, how to break a moral stance. We were just like, well, what's a moral code that you would never break? And then we were sat in a chair in front of the entire group and somebody else was chosen. It's like, now convince them to break that moral code. See, in hearing about that and reading about that, I so wish I could have been there because there are so like reading some of those like <laughs> questions and how to convince someone like, Oh my God, I would have done this. And yeah. It just, I got so excited, but it was really interesting. And it was very funny because at the very beginning I, I was the first one chosen to do anything and it wasn't that, um, or, or in, in the, in the next section that I, I was the first one and said, Russell, come here. And if you noticed under the chairs, there was a series of boxes masking taped off on the floor Sarah had me stand in one of the boxes and one of the other participants, Drew, was called up and she said, Drew, convince Russell to step outside his box. And I immediately thought of you. <laughs> <laughs> you put a lock and a key outside of it. I picture like a cartoon where like a, like a Wiley, Roadrunner, a Wile E. Coyote type of thing where it's like the trap for Russell is a lock and a key inside of a box. And that... <laughs> so, uh, and it was interesting because... I countered, you know, Drew asked me, you know, questions like why I wanted to stay, why wouldn't I consider? And I went to, I feel safe here. I know this, this is, and Sarah said, okay, we've reached an impasse. Let's try two other people. And the other people, she, she went through several pairs of people and there were certain levels of success, but nobody really stepped outside the box, but this was the first sort of role play exercise. And I realize now that it's, it's a role play exercise that, that more than likely you're going to reach an impasse. So this was like easing us into the role play thing. See, I think I could have changed that. I'll tell you later. <laughs> okay. <laughs> so I don't know if it would be ethical, but <laughs> the, the, the next step, it was very funny. Cause you know what Drew said to me afterwards he said, I should have just grabbed you and pulled you out of the box. <laughs> I was like, interesting play. <laughs> but that's not convincing you to No, me. it's not convincing me. But it was just like, I wonder how they would consider that. Because he would have succeeded in getting me out of the box. Mm. So, but you're right. It wasn't the goal. The goal was convince. So that, I thought, and so when you get to the moral, ethical role play of we were sitting in, she actually called it the hot seat. And you were being convinced or had to be convinced. You know, and it was very funny because I had to convince Drew to sacrifice himself in order to save the lives of somebody else. And I thought I was like creating a compelling argument. And it was very interesting because Sarah was standing or kneeling right behind his chair. And I think I took a tactic which she was interested in because she looked at me like, oh, and she had the realization. Because what I did is I made it very personal for him. Right. It was like, think about your loved one. If you have to close your eyes, if you have to imagine them, imagine that they're standing where I'm standing. You know, like I, I went that route because other people were like, if you could save 10,000 lives, like that's not how you convince someone of something. You have to make it intimate. You mm -hmm. have to make them feel something. Oh, yeah. So that's the tactic I took. And damn it if he refused to change. <laughs> <laughs> like, <laughs> I'm shaking my fist at you right now, Drew. And then Buzz, can, you know, Buzz did, uh, he had to convince me uh, on the stance of infidelity. And it was very funny because 
Buzz is good. <laughs> and what he did is he re redefined infidelity from the way I had stated it. So he found a loophole. And I ended up agreeing with him. And I said, oh, but wow. I, had, I had to clarify. I was like, because you've redefined this, I see a loophole, but it's not breaking my moral code. It's renegotiating was sort of the stance that I took on that, but, uh, but he did succeed. So, and it's very funny because later on that image of him convincing me shows up. So we went through this for, I don't know how long we were in there. I really don't know. It was at least an hour. Yeah, I think so. That we were doing these sort of role play games. And in the end, she had us all sit on one end of the room and she pulled out a small iPad and she showed us a picture of Noah Sinclair. And it was Noah in a business suit, and he sort of got his fist up in the air, sort of clenched in a power air fist pump thing. And she said, like, so, you know, what are your impressions of this man? What are your thoughts? And there were two different camps on Noah Sinclair in that moment. Some people said, business suit, he looks powerful. The fist in the air is a power gesture. It's like he looks successful. And the other camp was... It's a little trying too hard. It's a little cheesy. The fist pump is kind of a like it's too broish. It's too much. Uh, and interesting, there's uh, Brad was a member of this focus group. Brad was the w most vocal about the negative side of looking at that picture and making a judgment call on someone that you've never met and you're just looking at an image. So at this point, we hear sort of this growl coming from behind the door in the back of the room and Noah Sinclair bursts into the room and he's got a bottle which he throws to the ground later learned it was a beer bottle and he starts demanding I'm waiting for it to get good when is it gonna get good obviously referring to us so he sort of walks up behind the group he walks over to the side and the first person he really encounters is Brad who had been speaking negatively about him. Right. And he sort of like bro grabs his shoulder and he sort of, I, because of where I was sitting, I, I couldn't tell exactly physically what was going on, but I think he was like slapping the side of Brad's leg or something. He was like, yeah, you got some big ones. Yeah. It was like that attitude of like, Oh, you're talking shit about me. Mm -hmm. Like that was the attitude. Like, yeah. I was like, I know you, I got your number. He, you know, Noah was giving that vibe off. And then he walked around the back of the room and he, like Kristen's arm, he ran his hand all the way down her arm, sort of like, in a. it wasn't flirtatious necessarily, but it was just like, ah, uh, female, I'm going to touch. Right. You know, like she was sitting next to me. So that was kind of the way it struck me. He stopped behind me and he put both hands on my shoulders you know, sort of as if you were going to give someone a neck massage, except what he did is he put both hands on my shoulders and he sort of dug his fingers into me and he just paused there for a second. And he kind of like tapped me on the shoulder a couple of times and a little guttural laugh maybe, you know, that was that the vibe of that. Buzz was sitting right next to me. He leaned over, grabbed Buzz in a full headlock and goes, Buzz! <laughs> Which cracked the whole room up. <laughs> so... And he leans over and whispers, and I guess the whole room didn't hear this. I did because Buzz was sitting right next to me. He leans over to Buzz and goes, have they gotten into your head yet? Hmm. And Buzz said, no, they hadn't. So he moves around the room and he walks up to the front and he kneels next to Sarah. And he's like, I am still waiting for this to get good. So Sarah obviously is on the spot because this is her focus group. She's the discussion leader. So she tries to take control of the situation again by calling him out. It's like, okay, let's get some honest opinions about this man. Who thinks this man is a drinking problem? Which some of us raised our hands, some didn't. And then she got more personal and she was asking questions like, who thinks this man would put his goals above everything else, including family? Who thinks this man would let alcohol interfere with the relationship with the woman right in front of him sexually? And she called him out and tried to humiliate him a little bit 
and just saying like, look, alcohol is screwing with our sexual life, our family life, everything. So she called him out on all of it. Now who's dealing with rejection? Well, he turned away from her and he did the classic, like almost drunken stumble away from her. And she grabbed at him and sort of almost grabbed his tie. I thought she was going to pull him back. And he slipped away from her and headed back toward the door at the back of the room where he came in. And he stopped and he looked at us and he went, all you people, you don't know what you have done here today. He leaves and Sarah walks to the front of the room and basically says, hey, I think our time here is done. I think you should leave now. So that was the end of the focus group. And as we started to gather, it's very funny because some people immediately went to the snack table and grabbed everything. <laughs> like, really, guys? Come on. <laughs> so uh, people started to head toward the exit and Sarah was off to the side. She, she was like kind of fumbling with a chair at one point, like she didn't know what to do. And so I stopped and I made eye contact with her, Mike. And I looked at her and I, I didn't say it loud, but I looked at her and I said, are you okay? And she stopped moving and she stared me down. I swear it wasn't anger. It wasn't frustration. I literally could not read her expression. Oh, wow. Maybe she's realizing that you're not a delicate flower. I hope. <laughs> nice callback. <laughs> <laughs> but it was a very odd moment because I, I have no idea if... I, I, like The fact that somebody asked about her... Right. And there was no expression. Well, especially if she's saying all that stuff about Noah, it sounds like Noah isn't giving her attention. So now that she's getting attention, like, well, wait, people can care about me. She, it lingered for a few seconds and then she broke the gaze and she walked away and she started messing with the chairs and, you know, and so that's when I, you know, joined everyone else and I, I exited the room. Now we walked out and we kind of gathered and went, wow, that was a surprising ending. And a couple people decided, like, let's look to see the exit of the building. Like, how would someone get out of this building immediately thinking of Noah? We didn't have to wait long. Noah actually appeared at the street corner. Uh, and he crossed. And some of us immediately started to follow. I was kind of back. Uh, Buzz and I were talking about some stuff. And people started following Noah down the street. A couple of people threw up a periscope and he was obviously inebriated. I don't know if I made that clear about, I mentioned that he had a beer bottle that he threw down inside the room. He did appear drunk to us. Okay. I, I should clarify that. Um, sorry. I forgot to mention that earlier. Um, he is now, you know, he's not necessarily stumbling, but he's definitely weaving down the street. At one point he stopped at a signpost and thought we thought he was going to vomit so he crosses the street, we cross after him, and follow him about half a block more, and a police car pulls over, and he approaches the police car. They obviously take an interest in him because he is inebriated, and after a brief back and forth that we did not hear with the police officers, they stepped out of the car, they handcuffed him, and they put him in the back seat, and they drove away. So that was the end of the focus group. So I, you know, I immediately checked in with you because I had driven you there and I didn't know where you wound up. <laughs> and I didn't know that, that, uh, I didn't know where you were. So I reached out to you and I didn't learn what happened to you until much later. Yeah. So a couple things though, cause I, about what you just said though, yeah. um, in those scenarios and based on what Noah said, like you have no idea what you've done, you guys were all being videotaped. Yes. So what kind of stuff? could be used against you. Well, I'm glad you went there because I didn't know what to say about it. But now that you went there, I, I, I need to address this. There was one point very specifically that I think they wanted on videotape. Near the end, before the, the being asked about the picture of Noah, uh, Sarah had us all line up single file. And she said, look, I know every one of you has told some kind of a lie inside this room today. So here's what we're going to do. You're going to tell me why I should give you another chance, and you're going to have to convince me to trust you again. 
oh, that's coming back to bite you guys. So they, and it was very obvious because they turned the video camera. Oh, really? <laughs> so yeah, it was very <laughs> obviously, I, I didn't, I did not see anybody do it. But as I got closer in the line, I was like, wait a minute, why is that video camera at that angle? They angled it up. And I'm sure somebody turned the camera. I'm sure. I, I, I'm that's that's my personal belief. So we, so everyone was like, "I apologize. I'm sorry. I did this." It's like, please give me another chance. There was a lot of that stuff going on. You know, I think a couple a couple of people may have been trying tactics of some kind. Um, I spoke from the heart. And I said, "Look, I'm sorry if I hurt your feelings. You know, I can't guarantee you anything except this moving forward." I always speak from the heart. I always move with my heart. So they have us on videotape very pointedly apologizing for an action. Hmm. I think that's the most damning and possibly the thing that would make us most vulnerable. Right. So, yeah, I'm glad you mentioned that. I, I'm sorry I skipped over it earlier. Um, and we know that they were videotaping because later that night on Facebook, they posted screenshots from it. Right, which we, we assume they were because of, you know, all of us saw the cameras in the room. We assumed and, that we were being recorded. And what was the caption? We have all we need. Which is why I think that that apology and asking for another chance is going to come into play at some point. If they Ex just quoted that, if they just quoted, they don't even need the videotape. If they just quoted those words back to us. Right. Um, and that's what I meant earlier. The Im one of the image, one of the screen grabs was the moment where Buzz convinced me to change my stance on the infidelity hmm. thing that I'd stated. Maybe they should change it to, we have all that we need minus one. <laughs> <laughs> but also at the end when Noah came in, you know, Sarah turning the focus group into something personal yeah. is very interesting to me. And it felt very awkward in that room because everything is based on, on just perception. You know, we go back to perception again. So does this man have a drinking problem? The perception is that he came in drunk. You know, the perception is that they have a bad, a bad marriage. The perception is they're married. It's very interesting because I think Julie said that in the room in the moment. Oh, really? I, I, somebody did. Somebody said, I don't know him. Noah him. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> uh, you know, it was like, and I think actually Buzz also pointed out like, maybe he's had a few drinks this afternoon. That's not a drinking problem. Right. So, yeah, so it's funny that you say that because uh, I, I, I think that was voiced a couple of different ways in the moment. The, the, hearing it back from you right now and reading what I read on the forums, it doesn't sound like a focus group anymore. It sounds like a class in manipulation. I, it's interesting that you, were, you used the word class. I think they were not trying to show us how to manipulate I think they were looking for the master manipulators who already exist. Ah, okay. Which comes into play a little bit later for me personally, but I believe that they were looking at who was maybe the most ruthless, maybe the most convincing to get people to change their opinion or to sell an idea. Right. So I think it was, I think it was not a focus group. I think it was a scouting mission. Hmm. That makes sense too. That's how I felt when I left. I still I still hold true to that. I think that they were sizing us up and I don't know what for. Hmm. Interesting. Now, as I mentioned a second ago, Mike, we all went after Noah got arrested, we all went and met at a bar to talk about how we felt about all of this. And some of what we've talked about here came up in that conversation about possibly like were they looking for people who could manipulate well, like how well we lied. Um, so during that period of time, we had just gotten to the bar, you know, ordered a drink or two, and we were all standing around talking, Brad's phone rang and it's so funny. You know, you know what happened? He sprinted toward the front of the bar. No caller <laughs> ID. <laughs> because he couldn't hear in the bar. He answered the phone, and I guess it was a woman's voice, and he was having problems hearing. So he, with his phone to his ear, he's sprinting toward the front door of the bar, and of course... All of us sprinted after him, and he got up to the, like, he, he didn't leave the bar. He was right inside the front door. You could hear a little bit better. And apparently it was a female voice that said, don't believe the distractions. You are better than what they are selling. 
Hmm. And then that was it. That was the, the length of the message. Interesting. So I think that's a very interesting thing. I think it's interesting that Brad got that phone call because Brad... He was that, the, th the thorn in Noah's side. He was the most vocal about Noah. So I, I think Bre maybe Brad ruffled some feathers there by doing that. And who is this mysterious female caller? Like, you know, like, is it Sarah? He is didn't seem to recognize the voice. We asked him, you know, who did it sound like he wasn't sure? Hmm. Interesting. So many things. <laughs> so, but Mike, one mm -hmm. of the conversations that came up is people asked me if I had heard from you. Mm -hmm. And I said, I know he got a ride home. And he said that he's processing what happened. I interpreted that as that you had been rejected and that you were processing with that. And I was wondering if you were pissed off that you had driven up from, you know, your place and like literally to be dismissed within three minutes. Mm -hmm. I, th I wanted to know, and I was upset and you weren't answering my question. <laughs> <laughs> Cause it never happens. So, cause I had so much happening because, yeah, exactly. you know, people were messaging me, people were texting me, people were calling me and then right. I had to worry about, I had to walk uh, a couple miles to get my ride, which was my, my own choice. Like, yeah, I'm not saying anything that like, I just needed to just walk. Um, it's funny. I've done that after attention experience. Yeah. You remember last year I did that. I texted you. It was like, I'm walking to the, where everyone's meeting. And it was a couple miles away. Yeah. yeah. Uh, so I did that. And on top of that, it was pretty warm out. Yeah. So, and we we're wearing suits. And oh, yeah. so I was getting grumpy because of that. And it was just, <laughs> I was not in a good mindset to talk. <laughs> oh, no, I, I didn't take it personally at all. Oh, yeah. People were asking me, like, what happened to Mike? And I told them, I relayed the message you said, you know, that you didn't need a ride and that um, we would talk later. And then later on, it just said, still processing. Mm -hmm. So I passed that on. But yeah, I think everyone was wondering what happened to you. Yeah. So this is what happened. Uh, so, Mike, what did happen to you? <laughs> I, I left, uh, and we went through that second room uh, that we mentioned previously. And when I got to the first room, that first room you walk into from the outside, from the street, uh, there was a man there, and he was sweeping, uh, is assuming he's the, the janitor for the mm -hmm. place. Um, but, you know, when I described him, he was too nice because I think janitor gets a bad rap. Like, when people mention janitor, they picture, like, you know, a I don't know. It, 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 that seemed to be a lower standard of word hmm. to describe this guy because just because of, he was so nice. Oh, that's interesting. Cause I, I, I never registered that person. Okay. So, yeah. Um, I don't know. I just go back to, to the breakfast clubs. Like, oh, you're oh. afraid to tell your, your friends, your dad's a janitor. Like, Oh, got it. Okay. You know, that kind of thing. All right. Um, so I met, I met this man whose name was Otis, Otis Fletcher, and he was sweeping up and I walked out and he stopped sweeping and we looked at each other and he was just like, Hey, Hey, how's it going? I was like, Oh, hello. Um, and he, he asked me if I was here for that theater thing, you know, in quotation marks. Mm -hmm. And I was like, yeah, actually they, I just got kicked out for some reason. And I was only in there for a few minutes. He's like, Oh, that's too bad. And, and we just made small talk. Uh, he talked a little bit about the, like not knowing what was really happening. Um, but he said, it's like, yeah, some, some film director rented the building and I thought they were going to be shooting a movie here. So I was all excited. I thought I'd have my big break and, but it's just a, I guess it's just a theater thing. And I was like, yeah, it was, it turns out it was a focus group um, and they didn't want me in there. And he's like, Oh, that's too bad. And, and then he asked me, um, he's like, well, I, I hate to take up more of your time, but could you help me for a second? And, and I said, of course. And, he asked me to bring the mop bucket to the next room and the mop bucket was kind of heavy cause it had water in it and there was a, a ledge up. And, uh, so I did that. Um, I brought it to the room with him and he thanked me and he's like, let me, let me repay you somehow. And I was like, that's not necessary. You know, just this conversation is enough. And he, he kept insisting and he's like, let me take you to Carl's jr. We can get some food. And I'm like, Okay, but <laughs> let me warn you. I just Korean got, barbecue boy. Yeah, like I just had Korean barbecue and I can barely walk because of how much I ate. So he's like, well, that's fine. You can just get dessert or something. It, the, it's on me. It's my treat for helping me. I was like, okay, thanks. So we leave the building and we get into his car, which is parked right outside. 
and we go to Carl's Jr. down the block. It's like probably less than a mile away. And the way, the whole way there, we're just talking, just having conversation. He's telling me about his life, um, tells me about how he loves country music and how George Jones was so underrated and, and how he's from Buffalo. And he's, and he's right, by the way. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> You're the future Otis. <laughs> um, but we, we go and, and it's just small talk. You know, he told me he was from Buffalo. I'm like, oh, I'm from Massachusetts. And he was talking about Schenectady, New York. And I was like, oh my God, I used to go there to visit friends because when I'd go to Albany all the time and Schenectady is right there. And so he was like, oh my God, you know about Schenectady. So we were just, it was just small, like small talk, like getting to know each other. It was really, really cool. And then he tells me that he recently met a woman and it's the most beautiful woman he's ever seen before. And so me being me, I was like, oh, did you get digits? Ah, you know, like, and <laughs> he's like, no, like I didn't, but it was so, it happened so fast. She said she was going to reach out to me on Facebook, but here's the problem. I don't have a Facebook account. And I was like, oh no. And he asked me if I had one of those fancy phones and if I could help him create a Facebook profile. And I told him like, I, I have a phone, like I have a fancy phone, but I don't, think I'll be able to create a profile for you right now on my phone based on how Facebook works, but I can go home, create the account for you and, and email you later when it's done. And you'll see if you, you'll see Facebook will want to verify your email. So, um, you know, you need an email to sign up. So if you give me your email, we can, we can make this happen. And he's like, Oh, thank you so much. That would be perfect. So he gave me his email and I took it down. Uh, and when we were in the Carl's junior parking lot, I said, wait a minute. Facebook needs a profile picture. Let me take a couple pictures of you. So he's like, okay. And he, he took a, I took pictures of him and we drove back and he kept thanking me for helping him. And, and we, we even joked uh, on the way back. He's like, you know, maybe if this woman has friends or a daughter, I'll, I'll set you up. And I was like, all right, <laughs> thanks. Um, and, and I made a joke about being his wingman. Uh. And so we went back and he dropped me off and that was it. And it was at that point I was waiting for you because right. that maybe took like 20 minutes, 30 minutes or so. Right. And I was waiting outside and that's when I posted on the forums. Like I just got kicked out. And I think, I think Michael Gray called me out. Nice try, Michael Gray. Um, about like, oh, it's been an hour. Why is he just posting now? You know, because the conspiratorial thinking. <laughs> and, and that's why. Because I didn't want to go into that story right then and there when I was waiting outside yeah, because no. I wouldn't, I wouldn't be able to do it justice. I'd be like, Oh, by the way, I met this new guy. Talk to you later. You know, no. that would send people into like a panic. <laughs> like what? <laughs> um, but then as I'm waiting for you, a familiar face appears mm -hmm. and it's Noah. And I see Noah because I'm, I, I went down uh, maybe like 20 or 30 feet from, from the entrance to the building. I see Noah. He sees me. All of a sudden, the next thing I hear is, fucking Mike Fontaine. Last time I saw you, you were getting your dick rubbed in a bathtub full of blood. And wow. I was just like, I had that stupid smile on my face just because. And, you know, we, we went up to each other. We shook hands. I was like, good to see you, man. And, and just, you know, just started talking. And he asked me, he's like, what are you doing here? And I told him like, oh, I was supposed to be here for your focus group, but I got kicked out before it even started. And he's like, yeah, my wife's a cunt sometimes. Wow. And, and I was like, yeah, she is. <laughs> and, um, and so then it's just, you know, a little bit of small talk like that. And he's like, well, look, um, I have to go talk to some people, but you should probably leave because I'm going to be in there a while. So I was taking the clue that you yeah. guys would probably be in there and I should try to leave. Um, and then... I told him like, okay, well, I wasn't sure because my ride is inside and he's like, take a fucking Uber, take something. I don't care. But you know, and I was like, okay, I'm leaving now. Um, yeah. He just wanted he, you away from the building. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> and so that's when, when I, I started walking. Um, but then he went back inside and that was that. Uh, so then I got home and I created a Facebook profile for Otis. Mm-hmm. 
Uh, I did as much as I could from what I remembered. And uh, when I was creating it, it was like, that's why he was telling me all these things. He, uh... You know, it was like, so it was like, oh, hometown, Buffalo, oh, country music. I, you know, because if he's not technologically advanced, I want to make his profile look somewhat good. Yeah. Uh, so I put a background image about country music and had a quote and, and I put his, his profile picture up and I didn't want to take too much time because I wanted to, I wanted to. Uh, personalize the URL, but I couldn't until he he verified his email, and I wanted to like a bunch of pages, but I didn't want to go nuts. So mm -hmm. uh, after I did the basic stuff, I just emailed him, and I was like, "Hey, it's done. Here's the password, uh, and good luck. Let me know if you need any any anything else." And I told him like, "I friend requested myself from your account, so I can be your first friend." And cause that was something we spoke about. In That's the, awesome. Yeah. We spoke about that in the car ride. Cause I was like, Oh, I'll be your first friend. And he was like, Oh, that would be so great. And, and, and then, it, Oh, also in the car ride, I told him, or I asked him, I was like, do you mind if I talk about this? Because I think once your story gets out, you're going to have a lot of my friends wanting to be your friend as well. Is that okay? And he said, yeah, of course, I would love to. And I was like, plus, it'll make you look like a super pimp to this woman having all these cool friends on Facebook. And he's like, <laughs> yeah, let's do it. And so um, that and then that's when I late, later after I created it and after he verified it That's when I posted to the forums right and with my story and his the Facebook link and everything and then people started Editing him and he's talking to people and it's awesome and he's updating he's uploading photos. So he's getting it really quick You do realize that you just destroyed something today what? That hard-edged image of Mike Fontaine. You're such a nice guy, dude. I'm I'm not gonna be a jerk to to someone that's nice to me. <laughs> no, I didn't. No, I, that's not what I'm saying. It's just like, dude, dude. That that was like what you did was an awesome thing. He was super sweet, man. Yeah, I'm like, sure he was. He kind of reminded me of my dad. So, mm. very cool. Very yeah. cool. That sounds like actually a really, really cool encounter. Yeah, it was. And I got it. Oh, that's one thing I forgot to mention. What? So I got a chocolate shake at Carl's Jr. Oh, yes. And when, when we came back and when Noah came out and we were talking, he took the shake for me and just started drinking it. <laughs> and after he drank it, I didn't have any more because, you know, there's Noah likes to get around and hire prostitutes. So I was like, <laughs> maybe I don't allegedly. know. Allegedly, <laughs> I don't know what's possibly in your saliva. So I'm not going to have any more of this. That was very interesting. One thing that I didn't mention about the inside of the focus group. Did you notice the container of orange Tic Tacs? On yep. The, did you notice that they were open? Yeah. Buzz immediately walked up like, I'm going to have one of these. And then he, he puts one in his hand and I held out my hand and he puts one in my hand and he went, Okay, these are open, and um, what we know about, I'm not going to eat this. <laughs> <laughs> and then he picks up, and we both, like, I think I put the, the orange Tic Tac in my pocket, and we he opened the white Tic Tac package, and we had one of those. <laughs> the next in-person event is going to be sodas, <laughs> and that you have to drink after Noah to prove your trust. <laughs> that was quite the Sunday. Yeah. Based on what happened after, when you follow Noah, that leads into something that happened a couple of days later. Right. There was a lot of discussion exactly, especially after the focus group questions of, do you think this man has a drinking problem? Uh, you know, whether or not his arrest would affect the system, whether or not it would affect whatever this focus group thing was. Uh, because at that point, it seemed like things were unraveling for Noah Sinclair, Sarah Sinclair, and the system. Because this was not a good public display of competency, control. It wasn't. Even though Sarah, I will say this about Sarah. I think that woman, you, she, you said it. You, you talked about that authoritative vibe that she gave off. It's like, she's a woman who can control situations. I This thing... Was, did not go the way she expected. Uh, she's obviously a woman who's used to being in control and have power. That's the vibe that she sent to me. So I think the way all of this ended was like a chink in the armor. So the feedback in the community of, oh, well, we how can we take this seriously? How can we take Noah Sinclair seriously? I think what happened next was trying to address that. Right. It's good PR. 
they released a press release and it got emailed to all of us. And the interesting thing about this is some people got emails at email addresses that they didn't sign up to lust with. I didn't realize that actually. Yeah. Now, okay. Now I understand a couple of the comments I read on forum out of context. So yeah. Okay. The press release says that he was hospitalized for exhaustion on Monday, April 3rd, the day after the focus group. Correct. And that he shares a diagnosis of type two diabetes and the purpose for the press release had three points asking us for patience while they suspend temporarily suspend all activity of Sinclair industries. Number two, they want to raise awareness for a very serious and chronic disease that one in four adults may have without even realizing it. And number three, this is the interesting thing because this asks us to get information from Noah if he contacts us and that the brain is one of the first parts of the body to be affected by the severe drop in blood sugar and some mental changes that could occur are confusion, memory loss, irritability, conspiratorial thinking, aggressive behavior, and difficulty engaging in conversation. If you are contacted by Noah Sinclair at any point, particularly if you witness any of the previously mentioned behavior, please immediately A, ask for his current location, that's all in caps, and B, contact our team of medical professionals at SinclairHelp at gmail.com. So this, I mean, this has conspiracy written all over it to me. Yeah. You, you know, granted, it could be a PR cleanup for Noah, but... Well, I think that's definitely part of it. But there seems to be so much more. But it seems Noah is missing. See, I don't think so. I mean, that's part of the conspiracy thing, because... Why would they say he's in the hospital? But if you hear from him, get his location. So right. I like that's probably a cover up and he probably is missing. But based on the press release alone, like no, he should be in the hospital. So why are you asking us about all of this? Right. You know, unless they expect him to go rogue. Yeah. So I don't know, man. This is just weird. If it's as far as the PR cleanup, it's not very effective. Mm hmm. It's just, you know, claiming that diabetes has the effect that it does, which, you know, even though there is some medical legitimacy to some of what is stated there, I, it, it would not explain what we witnessed. Right. So I think, I don't know, there's a bunch of theories on this, but I think he's, he's getting close to something and close to releasing information. That's interesting. Like, I feel like he might be the Julian Assange of the system hmm. or OSDM. The interesting thing, Mike, I think in the community on, and on the forums, people started reaching out apparently directly to Sarah Sinclair, including people that were at that focus group and witnessed Noah doing what he did inside that room. And my impression from people, what people were saying on the forums is that Sarah was being very abrupt and almost rude and harsh. Like, why are you asking me for information now? We're dealing with something, sort of that vibe. Uh, I actually held back. I didn't email Sarah Sinclair until a day or so later, I believe. And I just simply stated like, hey, thanks for inviting me to the focus group, which I had intended to send that email anyway. But after the press release, I was like, well, I don't know what to say. So I thanked her for me being part of the focus group. And I said it was really interesting. And I, and I actually did see patterns in myself that I sometimes am unaware of. And I said, you know, it was actually, it was a positive thing for me. And here's the odd thing. She had, you know, people were actually posting some of the responses that they were getting from her. I was like, you know, you know, please understand. Why are you asking me for this now? It's like, I, I saw the, the abrupt nature of some of those responses. When she responded to me, she was actually very, very civil. And I had stated in my email that I wanted to learn more about the system. That was why I attended the focus group. And I still don't think I'm the clay that they are looking for because clay was the term that they originally used. Right. I also stated that I wished Noah and that she might be able to move forward and he might be able to move forward from this moment, whatever they're dealing with and build a strong future because she's obviously tied to this man, either business-wise or relationship-wise, whatever. So I just said, hey, look, 
hope everything works out. When she responded to me, she said, Russell, you are too kind, but you have given us more than we could possibly need. Oh. We feel we know you very well now, so perhaps I can put you at ease by letting you know that your answers did not matter as much as the fact that answered them all. And I think it was supposed to be that you answered them at all. Then she says, I'm sorry that we left you off of the list. Thank you very much for reaching out, Russell. So here's my question, Mike. Which list? I have no idea. Because th th there's two ways to interpret that. That somehow th that referred to the focus group. Or here's the thing. As you mentioned, that email went out to in, in various forms. And my first thought was, because I, I said, it's like, look, I, I'm aware of the press release. Did she think that I hadn't received it and heard about it from someone else? Oh, maybe. And that she didn't think I'd received the press release? That was the first, my, my first interpretation was like, oh, I'm sorry I left you off the press release list. It's like, no, I got the press release. And then I thought, no, wait a minute. If she's aware that I got the press release, which she probably is, I'm sorry that we left you off of the list. Does that mean the original list of people accepted to the system? Hmm. Could be that too. Like, okay, that's I, I, like that. <laughs> I, <laughs> me, I'm so wrong for this. <laughs> I am so wrong for the system. I, and that's and that I, I said it's like, look, I, I saw patterns in myself. I, I got something out of the focus group, which proved to me even more that. I'm not the clay you're looking for. But that's exactly the clay they're looking for. So they can mold you into the system guy. But if that's what she meant by, I'm sorry that we left you off of the list, the original list, like that blows my mind. Hmm. So everything, okay, if that's the case, everything that I have thought about what they were looking for and what they needed is wrong. And, and them looking for master manipulators might not actually be what's going on. Because I'm not a master manipulator. No. Okay, that was a little fast. <laughs> <laughs> you didn't have to quite go there that fast. <laughs> but you, like, look, look, you're you're my friend. You know that I don't have a poker face. I don't. I, I you know I'm very bad at playing manipulative games. Unfortunately, that means I'm somehow victimized by those games. God, I hate saying that I'm being victimized by anything, but it has happened. You know, where I've been a target and I've fallen for something that I shouldn't have fallen for. So we that happens to all of us when we're at Target. <sighs> oh, oh. <laughs> wow. <sighs> so anyway, so I thought that that was interesting that I got a very different feeling response from Sarah Sinclair than some of the other people. Well, I also think it's how you went about it, because I read about people that emailed like legit, like caring, and they got a caring email back. Okay. It was the people that pushed and prodded and basically called her out and it's like, I don't trust you, but what can I do? Those are the the responses that seemed more hostile. Okay. But yeah, it's, it struck me as odd, but that list comment really just confused me. Yeah, that's the... interesting. Yeah, it really confused me because like I said, I was like, wow, she must not thought I've gotten the press. No, wow, this could be bigger than that. So anyway, moving on from that Sunday and the fo next following days, more stuff continued to happen. Yeah. So when we originally found out about NoahSinclair.com, we found out about it by what appeared to be spam bots on the forums. That spam bot or one of them started posting again. And they posted a few times a link to this AI video. It links to a song called Mr. Shadow. And it's a song composed by artificial intelligence. Russell, you have it up. Can you read the description? Actually, the description on YouTube says, Scientists at Sony CSL Research Laboratory have created the first ever entire songs composed by artificial intelligence. Um, there's one called Daddy's Car, but the link is actually to something called Mr. Shadow. It's on a And it's creepy. <laughs> we'll have a link to it in the show notes, but it's, it, I mean, 
like thing computers are creating songs now without any input from us which is a scary thought true so the spam bot posts and then this is after the press release goes out then the spam bot posts again but it's not spam it's a legit post and it says one one tiny setback and you fucking jagovs lose your way faster than helen keller in a corn maze oh oh that's so offensive is it fuck you you know what's offensive that you knuckle dragging butt fucks are too busy crawling up each other's asses to even notice that someone might be trying to send you a message a ridiculously handsome, you're not going to fucking put me in a box of spin and bullshit this time, certain someone. So baby girl, I know you're listening. You can monitor all my accounts, you can bug my room, and you are more than welcome to watch me drink myself into forgetting that you're dead inside and have sold us all into an actual living hell, but you know what you can't do? I'm smiling. Are you? You can't stop the farm, dear. You know the one. The one that discredits their opponents. The one that trolls the conversations and subverts everything with contradictions until nothing makes sense. The one they think they no longer need because, well, you know what's next. Oh shit, does this sound familiar to our home viewers? Calculated disruptions? We know a little something about that, don't we? Sway an election? Change the national consciousness? Some might try to break the... Does this sound familiar? Does it sound like rain on your motherfucking I'm marrying this beast of a woman because she scares me more than the devil himself that gives me a weird and terribly exciting boner wedding day? Because the farm was still in the back channel and they are firing this out for me, baby. You and your ilk will all will be discovered soon. And you know, you know exactly why I am unstoppable. You think it can talk like me? I can barely fucking stand myself that every night when I choke down the last thing that quiets my regret, I go to bed knowing that good or bad, in real moment of truth here, hun, it's almost all fucking terrible, right? I am goddamn original and you, them, will never copy that. So listen up, chumps. Wake up. Rise up and slobber your way out of the maze and into the fucking sunshine because it's time to kick all their asses back to where they came from. I'll be in touch. N. So... That sounds like a love letter to Sarah from Noah. Yes, it does. And this kind of goes back to what you were saying with the press release is that he's missing because the way he's making this sound is that they're after him, they're monitoring him and him posting the link to the AI video, that's setting off a whole bunch of theories that there's like somehow artificial intelligence involved and you know, it goes back to Sabrina and like what, maybe they they had some technology about planting stuff inside Noah or maybe there's another Noah because he keeps calling uh, like the it so maybe there's an artificial Noah and it's just mind explosion time well also you have to think back to the helmet yep. from the tension experience which you and I have both worn very briefly and was supposedly what was used to shape and mold Addison. We should mention something that Julie noticed on that one-on-one -on -one in the last bookstore in downtown Los Angeles. During that meeting, she caught a glimpse of something that was being carried by Sarah. And it was a National Geographic magazine, and the cover of it was about future humans. And everyone is interpreting that as possibly AI. Is it cloning? Is it, uh, nobody knows exactly what the reference is inside the lust experience. So add to it that Noah is referring to it as it, mm -hmm. this it, whatever this it is. So some people were trying to connect it back to that article. So that's an interesting thing. The fact that there's something about the progression of humankind that keeps getting slightly referenced. And the art artificial intelligence is part of that conversation because who knows where that's leading us. Right. As, as a whole, as a society. So, so what, is Sin what is Sinclair Industries really up to? Right. Or is OSDM controlling them and what are they up to? I don't trust either of them. <laughs> <laughs> so right now, if we talk about the AI and this song created by machines that if you want to talk about the rise of the machines nobody knows how this fits in but it's interesting that that noah brought it up the way he did and when he did i think the timing is the most interesting thing because 
like we don't trust the machines right here's something i thought of and i know there's separate experiences but last year the tension experience gave us hidden messages and videos about data collection mm -hmm. about you know things with cell phones and stuff like that at the time it didn't really make sense i mean it made us look and like think like oh what is this about I'm getting that same vibe from this because we're all looking at this. And if it's one thing that we've learned, it's that they're, you know, first of all, manipulation, you know, like the focus group, but it's very look over here at the shiny thing while something else is happening over here. So what's really happening behind all of this? Right. You know, because if something was that, I don't know, I, I, I just get a weird vibe from it. Like, that they're trying to take our attention from something else, you know, and maybe that is Noah trying to take our attention away from Sarah and the fact that he's missing, you know, I don't know, but something about it seems off. I feel like it's, it's um, like we're in the middle of a card trick and we haven't seen what the reveal is. Yeah. I don't know. Uh, and then our friend Otis was saying he had headaches. Mm -hmm. And that was sad to hear because we know what happens when people get headaches in this world, they become someone else. Yeah. I actually, when he posted that, I reached out to him. I was like, just a random question. Um, by any chance, has anyone asked you to wear anything on your head? Because we had a friend <laughs> in the past that complained about headaches and found out that she was, had been putting something on her head and so he was like nope nothing's been on my head that i know of do you are you saying i look better with a hat and like started like playing <laughs> oh, it like that's that great so i was like oh no okay never mind just a headache that's funny but it, it's funny how instantly anytime anyone mentions headaches about anything it's they're wearing the helmet <laughs> it will be very very interesting to see if the helmet ever returns because mm -hmm. we're in the same universe <laughs> oh yeah <laughs> um and then the next day, or no, it was that night actually that all of those posts happened. Uh, there was a meetup planned, um, just, you know, hang out. And um, when they got there, when the people got there, there appeared to be notes and clues and things that were part of the lust experience. Long story short, it wasn't. And someone was trying to game Jack, but the good thing, the silver lining out of all of this is that the creators came forward and first of all, deleted the threads um, and told us that no, like going forward, like you will know if it's, if it's, if we're a part of this and they, they made Sean a moderator again, which congrats, Sean. Um, yeah. Everyone was very happy to hear that. Yeah. So basically if there's any time people do this again, it will be dealt with immediately. And it just sucks that someone has to try and like ruin it, you know? Yeah. I, as that was unfolding and people were posting what the puzzles were like and, and what they were th figuring out, et cetera. Um, uh, I had theater tickets that night, so I missed the majority of it as it was unfolding. And I'm really glad I did because it was such a negative thing to learn that somebody had tried to pull that sort of maneuver. And it was pretty elaborate from what I saw. That's the disappointing thing is why would somebody put that much effort to game Jack? Yeah. It's like, it's, it, you're, it's funny because somebody made the comment about like, we're not creating this event. We affect the event, but we're not creating this event. Mm -hmm. But Mike, we also have the power to completely destroy this event. Yep, exactly. And that's what was demonstrated that night was that literally that night it could have literally destroyed this. Mm -hmm. And it's something that a lot of people are enjoying. So for somebody to do that so recklessly, I thought was a very, very bad, bad decision to make. Yeah. Well, and you know, it, it sucks. And it, it seems like it's someone with, from within the community, just based on the information and the, the clues and the puzzles, but it very much seemed in plot. Mm hmm. But either way, it wasn't part an official part of Lust, and the creators made it known that it was not. And going forward, we will know. Um, and the community was was very swift in condemning the action once it was revealed that that was not part of the official event. Uh, so then the next day, 
another date appeared on Facebook and 41817. This is uh, next Tuesday. Uh, so who knows what will happen? Um, I know there was a meetup that Taylor planned in Orange County, uh, but is this coinciding with that or is this something separate? You know, obviously we don't know yet. You know, is it another focus group? Is it a search party for Noah? Who knows? Um, yeah, and, and we're wondering if the 17 means 17 participants. We don't really know. Right. Or if it's 1,700 hours. That's possible too. Or the year. <laughs> That's true, which is my first interpretation. Yeah. So, because uh, I'm simple. Um, <laughs> the, uh, the interesting thing is they posted that date and there seems to have been no follow-up with any specific details. I know they have another week yet, but it's just hanging out there driving people crazy. Yep. Clear <laughs> calendars. <laughs> but that same day, uh, a couple people got calls and Mike and Megan, uh, Megan in Minnesota got a call and Michael Gray from here, M&Ms. Ha. <laughs> um, but their call is pretty interesting because it was a woman and they, she asked them what kind of friends they would like and what kind of qualities they look for in a friend. And it's just weird. Like, so this goes back to the whole AI thing. Like if they're pr making friends for us, like, oh, you like loyalty, you like trust. Okay. Program this in, you know, like that's where my mind immediately went to when I was reading about this. Interesting. I, I, I don't know how to express this. But that theory of if they are creating something that we're going to meet or deal with, I have wonderful friends. Like really, I'm very lucky that I have like some very, very close friends. I have wonderful friends in my life. If somebody were to create something to help me, <laughs> wow, how, how, uh, how wrong I might be in assuming that it would be to help. Um, <laughs> the, um, I would want something that would make me face what I fear. Does that make sense? Yeah. I think because I think that's what something artificial would be able to do and I would think it would be safe. Maybe that's where the shadow rustle comes in. You have to face yourself as that person. If I end up in shadow rustle's trunk, <laughs> I'm going to have a problem. <laughs> <laughs> Who carries the keys in this relationship? I don't think Shadow Russell would like haunts, though. So, <sighs> Shadow Russell would be boring. So, never mind. Oh, don't. <laughs> <laughs> You're mean. Uh, no, it's just like it's just the idea of like if the the whole friends like what would you like in friends? Uh, yeah, it's it's an interesting question. I wonder where that's leading and why they're asking that question. Mm -hmm. Definitely. Yeah, it makes me wonder if this is leading up to whatever happens on that date. Like for more of like backgrounds. It's quite possible. So as of this recording, that's everything that's happened since the last one. So that's a lot of stuff hanging in the air. Why are people being asked about what type of friends and what qualities they want in friends? What is happening on 418? And what does AI have to do with any of this? What, why is Noah posting from a spam account? And is he going to start reaching out to people? And Sarah... What is she going to do? She's, she's not someone to not be proactive, in my opinion. Right. Is she going to start reaching out to people? Well, I think she's just taking orders. Like, I'm waiting for Michelle to make an appearance again from OSDM. You think so? Yeah. I don't think Sarah and Noah are on their own. Like, I think they're, they're a part of OSDM somehow. Like, they're at least in cahoots. I think they're tied to OSDM, definitely. But here's the thing. That focus group. Is that a slow burn? Is that information not going to come back and haunt us for a very long time? Or is it going to be immediate? Right. I don't think there's anything that... I'm speaking for myself here. I don't think there's anything in that focus group that I said or did that betrayed who I am. No, but the recordings can portray you that way. Yes, absolutely. I know someone who had a recording turned against him last year. <laughs> who is that <laughs> mike <laughs> but that turned out to be for the better yeah yeah praise anok but yeah, yeah like he... i can i can just see something happening like whether it be within the community or towards like personal friends and then all of a sudden that recording comes up well it's interesting because i 
when they started asking when i when i read about that about asking about the friends that was the the this is interesting you know are they going to start trying to create alliances or destroy friendships or something like that i hope they i hope they don't actually do that but you know it's it is interesting that those questions are being asked of well, what do you look for in a friend or, or what qualities appeal to you in a friend so and i wonder if it will tie to the force 418 event whatever that may be lots of stuff hanging in the air as we end this recording that's for sure oh yeah so and that sooner or later all of these are gonna all these loose ends are gonna become tied and blow all of our minds i think the future human stuff the ai stuff that's the that's the stuff that that my brain first of all I'm not entirely that interested as a, as a person. Mm -hmm. And I know people who are completely into Westworld and the AI theories, right. and the, like all of that. And that's the thing. Is this turning into Westworld? Like, is this a Westworld like thing? You know, that's what a, a few people are saying as well. I have a few requests if we do get to that point, um, <laughs> which we won't be going into right now. <laughs> I don't want to know. You're right. You don't. <laughs> <laughs> but you know it, it's interesting that that uh i well no let me put it this way i'm not interested in that as a science nerd because i'm not much of a science nerd what interests me about those thoughts is the emotional impact and the emotional ramifications of getting involved with that mm -hmm. that's what interests me and that's why i think the friend question is pertinent oh wait maybe that's why noah comes off as such a jerk because he's been dealing with ai so there's no emotional connection with them. So he oh. doesn't have to like be friendly because it's like, you're a machine. You're not real. Piss off. Oh, that's interesting. So, you know, the, the answer to that, we have to kill Noah with kindness. It would blow his mind <laughs> if everyone walked up to him. Like and was we so... are real feeling human <laughs> beings. So, <laughs> no, just everyone walked up and was jolly and happy all the time around him. He wouldn't know what to do with that. Oh, speaking of nice, like, okay. So early on, people had theories about Noah, like represents the devil. And when, after I spoke about Otis and people started friending him and, and talking to him, yes. people was like, maybe Otis represents God. Wow. So you have like the yeah. good and evil. I don't know about that. I don't know either. There's also but it's the theory that Otis about. is Noah's father, mm. which I, I don't know. I, yeah, I don't know. The, the, the thing that blows that out of the water for me is the fact that Otis was at that event. And it's hard for me to believe that he would not have crossed paths with Noah. So when I read that theory on the forum of Otis is Noah's father, I was like, nah. or is he a part of it? And I had my own private focus group. Oh, wow. And I bet he gathered a lot more information about you than they did about us in general. Yeah. But he never recorded me or anything. Mm -hmm. So, but that you I, know of. And, yeah. And I don't want to think that because he's so nice. Right. And like, ah, uh, but it's what happens when you theorize. Mm -hmm. Look at all the angles. Or what if, o oh, what if Otis is at the head of OSDM and he's like undercover? Like kind of like, what's that show? Like undercover boss? <laughs> and he, he's going to like focus groups to see wow oh that would be incredible that's funny okay i think that's enough for now <laughs> the clock ticks on yeah <laughs> uh so uh thank you for listening um and if, if you, you still are yeah. at this point <laughs> uh for more information on the lust experience you can go find them on the web at thelustexperience.com and make sure to check out the forums because that is where all the action is happening uh i find them on facebook at the lust experience on instagram the lust experience and on twitter lust underscore experience uh for noah's website it's noahsinclair.com and to find otis on facebook search for otis fletcher and uh we'll have a link to all of this stuff in the show notes i think that about wraps it up right yep so thank you all for listening i'm russell i'm mike see ya then something interesting happens I was waiting for you to say something, but okay. <laughs>